Our speaker this evening has quite an extraordinary history. He was originally founding VP of Sugar CRM. Has anyone actually used Sugar CRM? I have. Yeah, a bunch of you. All right. Uh, aside from that, he also totally transformed Pentaho, which was then acquired by Hitachi for $600 million. Please welcome the COO of Neo4j, Lars Nordwall. All right, thanks for having us this evening. Um, I think you guys are all a lot more technical than I am. Um, how many of you guys have heard about Neo4j in the past? How many are completely new to Neo4j? All right, a few. The ones that have used Neo4j, have you installed Neo? Only one, all right. <laughs> So Neo Technology is the company name, Neo4j is the product name. Uh, we're an open source company, we have a community edition, we have an enterprise edition that's the commercial side of the business. Uh, we're based in San Mateo, California. Uh, we're about 130 people. Uh, we have raised about 45 million up until this morning when we announced actually another 36 million in the D round. We are a little bit of an odd entity being based in Silicon Valley and almost reaching profitability <laughs> with uh, 45 million, which is quite unique since most companies are spending hundreds of millions to reach profitability. And uh, we have executed the company a little bit different where we haven't just hired a lot of people very quickly and then fired. 30% a year later when it doesn't work. Uh, we have applied a little bit more of a European approach where we hire as we go, and it has always been a resource constrained organization, and that has helped with the culture a bit more as well, where people trust the management, people love to be at the company, and I think that helps with the customers as well. Right, Tiller? <laughs> so we have at least one Neo4j customer here. Uh, Tiller is with UBS. Do we have any other ones, any customers with Neo? I don't think so, right? Yeah, Who are you with? Not with any. Just use it a little bit. Okay. Yeah, I'm just your student. Got it. Got it. Anyhow, uh, the company was incorporated in 2007 in Sweden. The product was actually founded much earlier, year 2000, as part of a different company. But the founders of the product uh, did a spin off took the IP of the product and then incorporated Neo Technology in 2007. Then 2011 is when we moved the company to California. Um, I joined the company in 2011 as well, and that's when we started to raise a bit more money to build the organization. And then we have had commercial customers since 2011 as well. What the company is most recognized for, I would say, is the Panama Papers. Oh, that's oh, right, yes. That's right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so the Panama Papers was revealed fairly recent. <coughs> Have you guys all heard about the Panama oh, yeah, Papers? Yes. Oh, yeah. yes. It's yes. more recognized in Europe, but uh, fairly well recognized in the US as well. It's, I believe, the largest data leak in history. And uh, uh, a person from a law firm in, uh, in Panama basically stole the data, leaked it to a journalist for a German newspaper, and uh, the German newspaper didn't really know what to do with the volume of data. We talk about more than 10 terabytes of data, more than 10 million documents. And many of those documents are very difficult to make sense out of for the human eye. If you read it, one document, it might be an account statement, but with very little information about the person. It might be a lot of numbers, unique identifiers, etc. And then you look at another document, and there's nothing in common with maybe an exception of a unique identifier. So this German newspaper basically decided that this is too big for them, and they basically pushed it over to a journalist consortium called ICIJ. 
And that's a group of a couple of hundred uh, journalists working together, pretty much based on a handshake, that any case that they work on will not be announced until they all agree. And uh, this group decided to basically use Neo4j. Um, and they had used Neo4j for a different leakage in the past with a large Swiss bank, HSBC. Uh, so it took them almost a year to analyze all the data. And uh, the outcome was, uh, uh, from their point of view, pretty spectacular in terms of the recognition getting a lot of uh, well-recognized people in big trouble for having offshore accounts. And nothing wrong having an offshore account, but it might be problematic if you have an offshore account with a lot of money and you have not paid taxes on, those, on that uh, cash. So that's what happens. The benefit of using Neo4j in this situation was that it was a lot of connections that you had to deal with. You had account owners that got offshore accounts through another bank. So let's say that you're in London, you contact your local bank with an interest to set up an offshore account. Once again, this is not illegal, right? This London bank may contact their partner bank in uh, Switzerland. The Swiss bank is then contacting their bank in Panama who's setting up this account. And then they need a lawyer, maybe, if you're talking about a larger capital, to orchestrate uh, this. And there's still nothing wrong doing this. But obviously, according to the law in the UK, you may need to disclose your assets. And if you don't do that, you get busted. So when you look at all these documents, you end up with a lot of different connections between documents and you may have a husband, you have a wife and they're connected to an address and there's a phone number and there's a unique identifier for a bank account and when you read all these documents there is no way you can make sense out of it. But then when you put it into a graph database, in this case Neo4j, and you start to map out all these unique identifiers and where they belong, it starts to make a lot more sense. And that's how for an example, the Iceland Prime Minister got busted within 24 hours due to his wife having a bank account that was associated to her husband. But those bank accounts were not easy to recognize since the names were misspelled or spelled in different ways and you had to jump 20 different uh, uh, paths to redefine that connection. And, and Iceland banks had already had failed, which he also sure. failed to note. Yep. <laughs> Anyhow, when you look at Neo4j and the database model, and you look at the way we gather business information, it is almost identical. So typically when our consultants run a work session with a customer and try to understand the business requirements and the technical requirements. In this case, oops. here we have the bank associated to a company. The company has a person. The person has an address and so on. And we convert that into our model. It's, it's identical. It's very easy for a business person to understand the Neo4j database model. And it may not look that powerful when you talk about seven nodes, right? A person is a node, a company is a node, a school is a node. And then we have relationships, right? But then when you start to add attributes to these nodes, so you can add whatever number of attributes you would like to, to the node, you can also add attributes to the relationship. When was the bank account set up? When was the bank account associated to your wife? When was the bank account canceled? And so on. It becomes pretty powerful. And even more powerful is that when you look at the bigger picture. So in the Panama Papers, when you have millions and millions of a bank accounts, and you start to put it all together, it becomes a lot more powerful. Other 
customers that are well recognized using Neo4j in production with great success are across different industries. We have Tilak here with uh, UBS. We have a number of different projects with, with UBS. Uh, but the same goes with a bunch of other customers as well. With Cisco, I think we have seven different projects in production. Everything from master data management to recommendation to content management. So it's spreading. As soon as we get into an organization, typically people like you guys push it to other groups, other projects fairly quickly. And the ramp in terms of the learning curve is normally pretty short. Would you agree on that? How many weeks did it take for you to fully? Couple of weeks, man. Couple of weeks, yep. Cool. So I thought, let's get into one area to truly understand the power of a graph database. I picked retail and master data management since I did a different presentation a couple of days ago related to master data management. But I'm happy to shift into a different direction if that's more of interest. Um, how many of you guys represent retail? Any? One person. All right. So I can make up a lot here, I guess. <laughs> so when we talk about retail, first thing you learn if you, if you do a business class or, or an MBA is to not get into retail. Never found a retail company since you can't make a profit. Right? It's extremely competitive, very small profit margins, and every single retailer have, has to represent typically a store um, uh, business to promote the brand, but also an online business. Right? And as soon as you have it up and running, you will get a competitor that will probably crush you one way or another. But having that said, when you get into the online business, you can build an app pretty quickly. Right? This is not too difficult. It looks pretty simple. Right? Sure, from a cognitive design perspective, it might be pretty straightforward. But when you, when you look at behind the scene, there's a lot of stuff to keep track on to stay competitive. So whatever product that you promote, you need to understand what the receiver would like to buy. Right? You would need to understand if the product that you promote is available in inventory, otherwise there's no point to promote it. You want to understand if this recommendation is appropriate for this person dependent on the DNA of this person, right? Because we may have promoted a product to a lot of people in the past and it doesn't work, then let's not do it another time. So you need to personalize, categorize prospects into different buckets, right? All this stuff would need to be figured out on the fly. And if you don't leverage all that information from different systems, could be, as an example, a person trying to order a product three days before Christmas Eve. Likely you want that product before Christmas Eve, or it's not of interest. So let's don't promote a product that's not available to be shipped, right? So there's a lot of information to, to be figured out before you promote that upsell or cross-sell product, right? And Amazon is pretty good at it. But they have a pretty sophisticated graph database themselves that they rely on. And the same goes with LinkedIn, the same goes with Facebook, the same goes with uh, PayPal. They all have built their own graph database. But they started to build those graph databases back 2006, 2007, 2008. And one thing that's unique with those companies is that they pretty much have an unlimited budget for IT projects. Most of you guys do not. And I think most of those folks would also admit that starting to build a graph database today is suicide. If you ask the engineers at NEO, they would not do it again, <laughs> since it has taken a lot of time. Pretty complicated. So when we try to associate this to analytics, um, this is analytics to me. I mean, you normally implement a lot of data warehousing and BI analytics solutions to figure out some of this information. And you end up with a lot of different silos of data 
could be supply chain data, it could be CRM data, it could be human resource data, and you name it. And when I speak to customers, there's no question that they value the connections of data, right? But they're still stuck with their legacy that limits them to leverage those connections. And if you try to figure that out with a traditional technology, like with Oracle, you end up with Oracle Rack. And that project is going to run for two years before you get it into production, right? But very often, we have customers already using Oracle Rack, or Informatica, or SAS Institute. And our value proposition is not to come in and rip and replace that, but rather to complement that solution. And that normally works pretty darn well. So when we look at Neo4j customers, we have them across different verticals. But I wanted to give you three examples. eBay is one customer that is using Neo4j from a routing perspective. So one of their competitive advantages is that when you order a product or buy something through eBay, you can get it delivered within 60 minutes. The problem they had was that often they were running into timing issues where the issue of being able to find the right shipping company to deliver a product in a timely manner, the query time to figure that out took longer than actually the shipment itself. Since when you look at the person's location, and you try to find, find out available shipping companies that can deliver this product with high probability, it's not that easy in many situations. It becomes a big graph problem, and the queries that they were wrestling with were super complicated. Walmart, another example where they do real-time product recommendations with Neo4j, they try to figure out who you are, what product that would be most appropriate for you to buy. And it could be that you look for a KitchenAid product and they want to figure out what upsell product, what cross-sell product, what additional product you, that you would be willing to buy. If you buy a product from Amazon, you get this recommendation. People that bought this product would uh, normally buy this kind of product. That recommendation is pretty lame in general. Since it's normally a product that's associated to the first product. But if you buy a KitchenAid product three days before Christmas, who knows, but maybe you're not interested to buy KitchenAid products at all. This is just a Christmas gift. And you're likely not going to buy two products, right? So maybe that upsell product that they should promote would be a completely different product. Maybe it's a TV. And based on historical data that they have on you, they would know that a TV is more appropriate to promote than another KitchenAid product, right? Adidas, they were wrestling, especially in Europe, with content used for different promotions. So they have great market share in various countries, and when they promote something and they leverage that content, let's say in Sweden, that content could be super appropriate in Germany, but it may not be in Italy. And once in a while they promote something and uh, it backfires, and they need to stop using that content with short notice. The problem they had was that they were dealing with content distributed on different servers in different countries all over the place. And they could not stop the usage very quickly. There was no uh, reliable orchestration of, of all those pieces of content everywhere. So by trying to figure that out, and let's see here. I'm actually jumping ahead of the game here. We will get into Adidas in, in a second. But the long story short is that they basically put all their content into uh, a storage database, and then they had a reference system, a metadata reference system to all the content. So whatever content that is appropriate to Italy was available through Neo4j. But 
content available or appropriate for Italy could also be available for other countries, right? And dependent on the audience, dependent on the location of the audience, dependent on the purchasing habits for, for that audience, they might be suitable for, for a certain uh, piece of content. So it becomes a very complicated graph very quickly that is dynamic as well. And with Adidas competing with Nike, um, they had to figure this out. With eBay, this is a quote we got from eBay uh, that is pretty mind-blowing in my book. Since they were using SQL technology to figure out the routing and shipping our products, and they could not work it out. When they were pressured to deliver products within 60 minutes, they could not work with the traditional SQL technology. And they tried over and over and over again. So the business case was pretty brutal. Let's look at master data. And this is related to MDM, master data management. But in my book, you can apply MDM to any product, any project that you deploy in the today market, since to me, any real-time stuff that you do, you need to have the metadata, you need to understand the MDM structure, or you get in trouble over time if the product is big. So when you look at CRM data, it's very graphy, right? You have a person, you have an address, you have a zip code, you have a phone number, you may have a bank account, whatever it is, right? It becomes a graph very quickly. When you look at products, you have a product family. A product family have, has multiple product lines. A product line has multiple products. A product has a lot of product parts. Those parts are used among multiple products. It becomes very graphy very quickly. If you look into an auto manufacturing company, their job is to try to figure out how to leverage one part in as, in, in as many models as possible, right? since the cost goes down. And then it becomes very graphic very quickly. Same goes with supply chain. Supply chain is probably the most connected uh, area, domain, that I can think of. Since you're shipping products or ingredients, parts, from one part, from one part of the world to another. Um, you, may, uh, you may manufacture certain parts in one part of the world you may get hit by an earthquake, let's say in Malaysia, and you may need to make a decision to move that manufacturing to a different part of the world very quickly. And when you do that, you gotta figure out, do we have enough uh, parts, ingredients, to support that manufacturing process elsewhere? And if you don't, you may need to make some calls very quickly whether or not how to distribute, split that manufacturing process up. So it becomes very, very graphic very quickly. And then you've got to figure out if you move that distribution manufacturing process elsewhere, can you make it all work, right? Employee graph is probably the easiest one to understand. This is more of a social graph. People are connected, right? This is LinkedIn, this is Facebook, and so on. Pretty easy to understand. But a pretty tough problem to deal with within a large organization since LinkedIn and Facebook may not be available to you the way you want to structure it, right? So when we look at this model, you have customer data or a customer graph. You may have a supply chain graph, a product graph. But when you put it all together, it becomes incredible powerful. So from an MDM point of view, if you have it all together, it is super powerful. Because otherwise, you may have the supply chain people pull a lot of ERP data from one system, let's say SAP. You may have another sales group elsewhere pulling data from a different system. And they all refer to order ID, but that order ID is different. It's, it's not the same definition in different systems. And that's when, when the big challenge starts especially then when you have a CFO reporting profit margins, leveraging data from certain systems, and then you have a VP of sales referring to profit margins, 
pulled from, from other systems. So large companies are wrestling with this on a daily basis and there's not an easy way to, to resolve it with, with legacy systems. And the use cases that you can apply here would be, I mean, all over the place, right? For Neo4j, we see master data management, we see recommendations, uh, fraud detection as very common use cases. But you can apply it to many more. But for us, we're somewhat limited with 130 people. So those are the ones we focus on. So the classic challenges, and this was um, confirmed by, by the audience I had a couple of days ago as well, that they're dealing with silos of data, CRM data, supply chain data, and so on. And it, they're stuck with that data in different, different systems. And then every month, the business side come up with new requirements. And once in a while, they have new acquisitions and merges to deal with, with a lot more systems coming in. And they need to move super quickly. And at that point, it's not fun anymore to be with an IT. You better figure it out. And the business side is normally very unhappy with IT's ability to move fast and support the business requirements, right? And it normally has to do with your infrastructure being static, not being able to support changing requirements all the time. And that's a huge benefit with, with a graph database, that it's a schema-less model. So you can build it out as see it as a normalized model, and you can just build it out with no limitations. Then of course, it, it puts a little bit of pressure on you to keep track of what you're doing, but it gives you a lot of flexibility. So how can graphs help you? From an MDM point of view, we see two different scenarios. One is that you leverage a graph database from a metadata perspective with different pointers. You don't really store the, the core data only pointers to reference data, or you go with a more advanced solution where you store master data, right? And let's talk about both of these. So with a reference system, that is typically our recommendation since it's a lot easier. Normally we don't recommend the customer to re replace an existing, an existing transactional system, since it's, it can be a pretty hairy system that's very difficult to replace but to build a reference system to get more value out of the existing investment is much more straightforward and less risky. So when we have all these existing systems, CRM systems and uh, maybe supply chain systems and so on, you can of course come up with unique identifiers and pointers to all those attributes by system, right? And come up with your own graph model and you're not going to remove the core data, the master data in those systems. You're only going to point to the order ID or the uh, sell to data uh, ID or the customer ID, whatever it is, right? And remember here that the order ID in the Oracle Finance system might be different defined than the order ID in the Salesforce.com system, right? And the order ID in Germany might be different than the order ID in the US. And the product hierarchy structure in Germany is probably different than the product hierarchy stru uh, structure in, in the US, and so on. And the way finance is reporting the data is probably different than the way HR is reporting the data. So the complexity goes on and on and on, and that's the reason why you typically see large companies having dozens of data warehousing uh, solutions, and you see every big company having 20 different BI technologies in production. They have MicroStrategy, they have SAS Institute, they have Brio, they have business objects, they have the latest stuff, they have everything. And it's all fairly messy. Since there's no master reference system to point at. So Cisco is a good example here where they have built an MDM solution with reference data to all their core data. So if you're within Cisco IT, and you're asked to build a new data warehouse system. You have to pull data from the reference system. 
If you need shipment data, you need sell through and sell to data, you need inventory data, you have to pull all that reference data through Neo4j. And that means that all those new systems getting built are leveraging the same definitions of the data, which is super powerful. All right, let's get back to Adidas. So when we look at Adidas, they had a huge challenge when it came to content used for different promotions in different countries and different regions for different products. And a lot of that content could be reused. One piece of content could represent one product, but this piece of content could also represent another product. This piece of content that could be very successful in one country could also be very successful in another country or actually a disaster to be used in another country. It could possibly be uh, something that could be inappropriate in one country and you want to stop using this piece of content in other countries. So how did he stop that when pieces of content was downloaded by various marketing people in different countries on different servers they had no orchestration of that. So they started to put that all into a metadata repository with different domain representations where if you represented one country, maybe you were only allowed to use a certain piece of content and on and on, so different layers. And they built this solution in about six months and then pushed it to phase two another six months and it has been in production for a couple of years now, with great success. The other more powerful implementation would be to use the master data, right? This is when you look into the core data of the business. And if we look at one interesting case study, uh, this one represents one of the largest retailers in the US where we have a CEO that's been, ar been around the block for many, many years and he orchestrates a Monday afternoon meeting with his leadership team between 3 and 6 p.m. Often those meetings run to midnight and you don't want to be in those meetings since they run long because someone gets into trouble. Maybe sales in a certain store has dropped and the executive representing that store cannot explain why. Or maybe the shipment of products from one country to another to produce, manufacture these products got stuck. And the executive cannot explain what, but it impacted the order volume or it triggered complaints to a level where the CEO is concerned. So this company have or had 500 business analysts working on reports to support this Monday afternoon meeting. 500 business analysts, and they were using Teradata, they were using a bunch of different BI technologies to only support the executive team to stay out of trouble. And the CEO was very unhappy in those meetings since he could not stay ahead of the game, since he had a lot of questions all the time and very creative suggestions how to cross sell products, how to upsell products, maybe combine a purchasing behavior where um, the company has many different divisions and those divisions are different brands. So maybe you wanna, if you buy online, you wanna combine a promotion where if you buy this product, I wanna give you this product for free. The problem is that this product is from a different, uh, different branch. So this branch, there's no way that the GM of this branch would give this product away for free, <laughs> right? And then you have conflicts of interest. But from a CEO point of view, we want to just execute and prove that this is the right thing to do. But he was wrestling on a weekly basis with friction and bottlenecks with arguments from executives that, no, you can't do this, you can't do that. So what he did with one of our partners, FactGen, was to build a data warehousing solution in five weeks. It took them five weeks from scoping out the requirements to production. And what
what they did in five weeks was more powerful from a CEO point of view than what they have done in a number of years with traditional technologies. And it's not that they built something super complicated in a very short period of time. They're not that smart. I give them a lot of credit, but they're not that smart. But they were using a graph database to address those problems. And the only way they had structured the data in the past was with a relational database and with a bunch of different BI tools. And when they had dynamic requirements on the fly all the time, and they wanted to consolidate data from different branches, couldn't do that. Or they could do that. The problem was that it took a week to get the response, because they had to wait to the next Monday. So the business case here is, is uh, significant. Because they were basically spending a million per week. And then, of course, the upside by getting the right information in a timely manner is even bigger. So this retailer is super happy, but you gotta, of course, deploy Neo4j in the right way. I'm not promoting Neo4j for any use case or for any business problem. I mean, you gotta figure out the use case. In this case, it's, it's analytics, and we're not spending a lot of time on analytical use cases. We're spending more time on fraud detection, MDM, recommendations, and so on. But we're starting to see a lot more requirements in the analytics space as well especially if we're talking about real-time analytics. How many analysts do they have after the <laughs> <laughs> They still have all those 500, uh, but this solution rolled out about uh, six, seven weeks ago, but they're making a lot of changes. Uh, but this was, this was a highly visible project within that organization where the COO, the CIO, a bunch of other people, responded to our partner with a very simple message last spring when they pitched it. There's no way they can do it. There, there's no way, and they were kicked out. But what happened was that one of the investors to this uh, organization, our partner, is a pretty senior guy that had a personal relationship with the CEO. So he was pulled back in and basically committed, we can do it. And he got the chance to do it, and, and pro the executives wrong. And now the system is in production. Master data is actually a pretty compelling use case. Can you can you elaborate a little bit on how you brought all brought brought together all the silo systems and potentially working with some of the MDM systems like Informatica that would that would be in any of the big enterprises? Sure. So there is a bunch of different MDM. Uh, packages and technologies out there. I believe Informatica is one of them, probably the market leader. At least that's what they claim, and they've been around for such a long time. But Oracle has their MDM solution and so on as well. So the limitation with many of those systems is that it's not very dynamic for new requirements. And new requirements is, I mean, that's just the business today. When Informatica built their solution, when Oracle built their solution, it was designed for yesterday. If you go back 15 years, requirements didn't change that much. Data wasn't that highly connected. I remember when I built data warehousing solutions 15 years ago, it was a hierarchy of data. This part rolls up to this product, this product rolls up to this product line, this product line rolls up to this product family. Rarely, this part was going to be used in a different product line. Today, it's just a spider web. Everything is connected. People are connected. Few people report to one manager. You report to two managers. And then within three months, there is a reorg, and you report to someone else. But we still got to track everything since you work in the bank, and regulatory requirements forces me to keep track of everything you have done historically. And then it becomes very complicated. Many of the MDM technologies are old ones. I mean, what, what I discovered when I presented at, at this MDM conference uh, two days ago, and we had 800 people at this conference, is that I was at those conferences with the same orchestrator 15 years ago speaking. And the funny thing is that I told one of my colleagues here that nothing has changed. 
it's the same freaking people attending. They were just 15 years older, and they have, they have the title of VP of Data Policy or VP of MDM or whatever. They're smart people, but they've been doing the same thing, and they've been working on Informatica for 15 years. And Informatica has done a couple of acquisitions, and they're struggling to get it in all integrated, and I think Informatica has done a fantastic job with, with, with their current assets. But requirements today look different. And that's where graph databases like Neo, but also other new technologies can help, since you can normally figure out a way to put less pressure on your existing system by maybe just synchronizing the most complicated, the highly connected data with Neo. So if you have maybe hundreds of thousands of customers, but you know that 30 of your most complicated customers are causing slowdown with queries and whatever, then maybe you run different queries against your graph database, only representing those uh, top complicated customers, right? Yeah. And we have a few of those customer examples. One would be Telenor, the 10th largest uh, telco in the world, where they were struggling with um, admin updates of uh, accounts. So let's say that you work for uh, Stop Oil, one of the largest oil companies in the world. Let's say that they have 100,000 employees. Every employee has a cell phone with a data plan, with a voice plan. If you're part of finance, you can only call within Norway. If you're a salesperson, you can call within within the world, right? A salesperson may move into marketing, so different policies, different requirements, and I need to keep track of all the billing data, historical data, even if you move into a new department. And one sales guy has negotiated a family plan, whatever. And they had thousands of updates on a weekly basis. Since they move people into new departments, they fire people, they hire people, and so on. So they started to complain to Telenor that you gotta fix your system, since just to save an updated query is eight seconds. And I have 5,000 people per week. You gotta figure it out. And those customers were slowing down the system for everyone. And this system was based on SAP with Sybase. So they decided to experiment, and this was five years ago, with Neo4j. They made, it, made a decision to pick their top 20, top 30 customers with very complicated uh, data structures. But those were the most important customers. And put that into Neo4j didn't mean that you were going to remove the data from Sybase. You were just going to synchronize the data. So then when an admin person from Stop Oil was going to update the data, they hit Neo4j. And Neo4j would then synchronize with Sybase. What happened with this project was that within six months, one guy, and this is, we're not proud of this since we want to make the product bigger. We had one guy at Telenor building the solution. And within nine months, we didn't have 30 customers in Neo4j. We had every single customer of Telenor in Neo4j. Every single customer. And the system ran extremely fast, a millisecond to update any record. But however, we did not replace the master data from Sybase. That system has been there forever. We would not touch that. Then the side story is that the SAP HANA team has been in there every day to get this business, this project back, since it's a highly visible project. And they were willing to give away their product for free, but it didn't make sense. And I could argue here that, shoot, we should have had 25 people running this project. We had one guy. And that's very common among Neo4j projects. Typically, it would not take more than 100 days to bring a project from start date to the finish line into production. And typically, you would only have two, three people on a project. If you run an MDM project with Informatica, if you talk anything less than 12 months, I would be surprised. If you talk a team of less than 10 people, I would be surprised. But if you look at Adidas, you look at eBay, you look at Walmart, you look at even this project with a huge business case, our partner had two people working on it. 
Then they had an executive and they had some other very senior people managing the relationship, but they had two technical people working it. It's rare that you see more than five people. We have one exception with one of the largest postal services companies in the world that is using Neo4j and every single shipment, every single moment of a package for this postal services company goes through Neo4j and the routing. And they were using Accenture to build this system. It took 12 months, 150 people. But that's a rare exception and a very complicated system. But typically, you have two, three people running the Neo4j solution, and it takes less than 100 days. So what we advise customers to do is experiment. I mean, you can afford to fail with Neo. But typically, they make progress, and they figure out the sweet spot use case, and then it advances. And what happens is, like with UBS, we have multiple projects. With Cisco, we have multiple projects. And we see that with a bunch of other organizations as well. So it's pretty easy to get up to speed. Can I ask one more question? Sure. You're, I think you're earning a t-shirt for a second t-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> you know what a t-shirt I did? I need to do justice to it. That's right. <laughs> when you talked about, uh, specifically talking about the use case that you described for Aridus, this might be more of a technical question. Did you have the content also stored in Neo4j? Or was it stored in a, in a, in a content repository, like say Alfresco or, or? They had, I don't know the repository, but it was a different, they okay. didn't store the content itself in Neo. <coughs> it was more of a metadata reference point system. Right. Can you give an example of usage of Neo4j for ontologies or taxonomies somewhere? No, I cannot. <laughs> okay. Can anyone help me? Greta? Mm, no. no. Sorry, but I'm happy to get back to you. Okay. Um, who are your competitors? Who are our competitors? Okay, so what's your sustainable <coughs> competitive advantage compared to this? Sure. Um, very good question. When I started with Neo 2011 and 12, I was ashamed to provide the answer, since the answer was we don't have a competitor. And, and that doesn't make sense, since then the space doesn't exist, right? But. Then I experienced when, when I hired um, a buddy of mine who, who joined us as a sales director back 2011 and, and kind of I pulled him into the company since we were eight people. We were almost running out of money when, when my CEO pulled me into the company. Um, and, and this guy, Charlie, who is now the VP of sales for North America, he was like in, in like one year into it, we had this all hands meeting where we're presenting different wins. And Charlie explained to, to the audience that we were always trying to make it up a little bit on the sales side that, oh, we were fighting so hard to win this deal and we're so good, right, when we talk to the engineers. And then Charlie explained, we don't have any competition. This was just a slam dunk. It took us 30 days to close the deal. And, and it's, it, it, it was actually true. Now we're starting to see more competition, but we have created a new domain, graph database. The graph database domain did not exist in 2011. People were laughing at us. I mean, sure, you have, had, you have had a domain similar to a graph database, like an object-oriented database and so on, but nothing that really worked, nothing that really scaled. Today, when you look at it and you talk to Gartner, you talk to Forrester, their prediction is that graph databases will just skywalk. And we have 250 customers, half of those are Global 2000, and we start to see repeatable patterns of you move from supply chain department to CRM department to HR. Um, competition would be probably that the prospect, the customer would wait, since we're a new technology, people don't really know how to deploy this. There's no budget for a graph database. So you present it to your manager and the person is skeptical. What is a graph database? No, I don't believe in that. We gotta use a traditional technology. I like IBM. Um, our value proposition is typically different. So what we provide is you can do anything in a relational database that Neo4j can do, but maybe not at the same price or with the same performance. Neo4j typically, when you use it for the right use case, performance is brutal. You cannot compete. But you can normally deploy something 
in Oracle Rack. That's what Cisco did with their master data management solution back 2011. They had an Oracle Rack solution, and they spent a lot of money to maintain that solution, a lot of money. And then they basically transitioned all that over to Neo4j. And they have a small team of three, four people managing a very complicated solution. So then Oracle Rack, yes, I guess they were our competitor, but we don't look at it that way. Typically what happens is that we may compete with another vendor sales representative on that budget, on that solution. But then at the same time, you see Microsoft, you see IBM, you see Oracle on stage with Neo when we have an annual uh, conference. So from a strategic point of view, we partner with them. Same with Informatica. Then within some of our organizations, we compete head to head with Informatica. But that's a very tactical issue. Uh, when comparing uh, from a vendor selection or technology pers selection perspective, Neo4j versus OrientDB and TitanDB, one of the issues that gets raised is uh, the licensing model. There's been confusion about that, and I think it's changed over time. Yep. Um, when I last looked into it, there was a, a, a community version that doesn't support failover clustering, but that's using, I think, mm -hmm. GPL3, and then there's the commercial a GPL version, and so maybe you could help us understand if we're building a service that's connecting to it through an API, for example, rather than bundling it and creating a product, do we have what kind of licensing model is applicable there? Sure. Did you all hear that question? And can you add on a hands on web services while you answer this question? Sure. So we have a community edition that can be used freely for many different purposes, right? The Enterprise Edition provides more functionality like security, like clustering, administration, and so on. And a lot of the product development today goes into the Enterprise Edition. Because we believe that Community Edition has reached a stage where it's actually pretty darn good for a developer to play with it, to prove that this can work. But at the end of the day, we as an organization need to make some money. Otherwise, we're not going to exist tomorrow. So therefore, our selfish agenda, of course, is to make enough money from enterprise to grow, but to give the community addition away to build up the community, right? I think, I think some customers or organizations get, a, get away with a community addition. The problem is that this is a database, and it's software. We're not perfect. No one is perfect. So it may go down once in a while. We do not support the community edition. So we have some organizations calling us desperate since they have their production system down. And then we figure out, well, you're not a customer. We can't help you. But it's even worse. They have customized the community edition for two years. And we can't transition that one over to enterprise. So at that point, all their work invested is wasted. And for what? Because some technical people decided to build this without looking at the partnership model. Then, if you're a small company, we have a pretty compelling offer. That is that if you're a startup, you use the Enterprise Edition for free. I didn't really mean it from the perspective of a free edition versus a paid edition. What I meant is in terms of open versus closed source. So if you mm, use, I see. If, if, if I make a, 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 an online service and my data is powered by Neo4j, Yep. Under the licensing, there's been confusion and t dialogue on Stack Exchange, for example, about am I required to open up the source code of my service simply because I communicate to the Neo4j API? I see. So typically, of course, you would need to share your source code if you use the community edition, right? I mean, that's the, that's the open source purpose, that use it for free, share your code base, right? But typically, we are quite flexible. If you as an organization, you don't have the budget, you don't have the funding, and you can clearly illustrate that we're interested to partner with Neo over time, we will figure out the model. If you're a startup, you can use it for free. If you're a large organization, typically we provide you an eval license or a production license for whatever time frame to build the business case internally. But typically the fee for Neo is a fraction of the benefit. 
I don't want to get too much into the, the open source licensing. No, I think you've answered my question. Thank in you. terms of AWS, um, we have a lot of customers running on AWS, and we have a lot of customers running on Microsoft, and I mean, that's the future, right? So a lot more of Neo4j will be in the cloud, but today we work with different cloud providers, and I mean, it's up to the customer to... So, is it more? Is it easier now to use AWS? Do you have a path? I mean, do you have it sitting out there? That I, I, as a customer, to try it. I can just start loading on AWS. Is it preloaded? Do you have a pre-configuration on AWS now? Uh, we, you, you still got to do some work, but we have dozens of customers that have done it, so it's not very complicated to do it with AWS. Uh, we have cloud providers like the one you referred to, Graphene, and a few others that are small companies that have taken Neo4j into the cloud, and if you don't want to worry about the hardware or the software, you can work with, with Graphene directly to get Neo4j as a database, as a, as a service offering. Uh, Are they using AWS? Um, Graphene is not used, uh, not, I don't think so. I think they were considering that in the beginning, but they're not at this point. But going forward a couple of years, you will see a lot of database as a service offerings from Neo. I mean, that's the future, right? To only rely on an on-premise solution in the today market is suicide. But then we would work with Microsoft, we would work with Amazon, we would work with Rackspace, we would work with other providers to make sure that we have the infrastructure, the platform that the customer would ask for. And tomorrow as well, not tomorrow, but in the future, you will also have more of an admin console where we can help you to, to basically manage your solution on various platforms. <coughs> but we're in the early stage of that, but we're moving pretty quickly, and as I mentioned earlier today, we, we've got some cash in the bank that will help us to move faster. Is there an infer inferential component to Neo4j, meaning uh, does, oh, that's what you're gonna, I mean, uh, the. In the Panama Papers, in addition to just being able to visualize the, you want to say obvious links, even though there were millions of them, inferences also could be drawn. And from what I've read about it, I was under the impression that uh, Neo4j drew some. Now, I may be wrong. Or is that, is that a component, or is that you basically need a, an intelligent person. You mean the visualization part? Well, in, and an inference meaning if this, then this, if there's a relationship here. Semantic query. Yeah. yeah, if there's a relationship here and there's a relationship there, there is also a relationship. If A then, if, if A is related to B and B is related to C, A is related to C. Yeah. So we're partnering up with a bunch of different visualization technologies like Lincurious, Cambridge Intelligence, and a few others, and they would help to facilitate that, that analysis. So if you have a reference from A to B, or an A to C, or, or more pointers with a visualization system app, I mean, you, you could illustrate that in, in a, in a no, 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 but that, my question is, but does Neo4j out of the box, so to speak, can it does it do that? Is, is that part of it? or um, You would need to build the functionality. You would need to build it. Yes. So we provide, it, it's a little bit of a plumbing uh, product today that is getting refined. And we're moving pretty fast into more of a package offering where you can get Linkerius with Neo4j. So you would have that, that solution set. And then customers like Lufthansa has Click Tech, Click View on the top of Neo4j to build their BI solution, as one example. But we are a horizontal <coughs> product provider. We're not building vertical applications, or we're not verticalizing the product. So it's more of a horizontal product, and then we try to find different use case sweet spots. And then we work with visualization partners, BI partners, and so on. Does that address your question? You are, the answer is no, it doesn't, but yes, it does answer the question. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right, how much more time do we have, Derek? Yeah, about 10 minutes. Okay. I think I'm to, to my final slide here, so go on, guys.
you have uh, encryption at rest feature? And do you have a Neo, do you have a Node.js client? Yes. Yes. Yes, both. Okay. We have drivers for just about every language. What was the question? A Node.js client. Node.js client. I remember a year ago I couldn't find it. So. Right. right. You guys are very dynamic. I'm impressed with involving more questions. <laughs> All right, more questions? Uh, yeah, first a clarification to, 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 to the lady that was asking for inference. That's more about logical inference, how you yeah. infer facts. But there are other graph databases that I don't want to advertise that, that has this like built-in feature and new don't does it anyway. So my question was, uh, you, you referred several times to extremely good performance gains for specific use cases. Uh, and being out of competition in various ways. Uh, in databases, like in the relational databases, that there, there are standard benchmarks with audited results like TPC and similar things. You know about it. Yeah. Uh, in graph databases, it's probably for two years now that there are similar standardized batch benchmarks. But new, new, new technology is part of something called uh, linked data benchmarking calcium. Mm -hmm. And there are benchmarks about graph databases. One of them is social network benchmark, other things. Sure. Have you published results? So we have published, we're working with a couple of different groups. One is in Europe, connected to a German university, TUM. And we have a couple of other projects as well, working on various benchmark projects. I'm not fully up to date on those, but I know that our co-founder, Johan, is in love with this since he wants bigger boxes, more machines to run tests. And uh, one focus area is to make Neo4j more reliable, but also to be able to run incredible large volumes of data. So in the past, we were limited to a volume of nodes and relationships up to about 32 billion. But we removed that cap recently since the perception was that Neo4j doesn't scale, can't deal with big data. This wasn't the question. No, I, I, I understand, but in a complex, complex graph problem with graph that is way smaller than this. Right. And this, this is the case with these benchmarks. Yeah. I happen to be part of the project, so I can. Oh, tell okay. You. Yeah. But but we're we're happy. We would love to be part of more benchmark projects, and the salespeople would love to have more data to justify if it works or not. And it also helps us to steer us in the right direction since we get bombarded by inbound leads and, and uh, technical people that would like to deploy NEO on different projects. And we want to know where is the sweet spot. So it's just that the performance claims will be way more critical. Sure. Yeah. Okay. And, 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 and to me, benchmark is all companies come up with benchmarks and they claim X, Y, and Z, and, and it can be in such an isolated environment, it looks great, and then with a different use case, it, it, it doesn't really work. But the, po the point is that we want to do more benchmarks. Don't, don't downscale it, because <laughs> the European Commission, in this case, invested like several million, and yep. several vendors were part of this to define benchmarks, right. audit procedures, and everything. Yeah. So it's done right. Yeah. No, just but publish. But benchmarks are incredibly important. My, my, my point is that you can do it in so many different ways. And we would love to work with you if, if you're open to it. We already worked with you for two years. Oh, we have. OK. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And what's the name of the, of the group? Which? The, 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 it is an association. It's called Link Data Benchmarking Council. Okay. And it's uh, my small company, your mid-sized company, IBM, Orco, a bunch of guys, everyone who has to do something. Cool. Yeah. And is it based in Europe or here? Both ways. Last time we had a meeting in, I, in, in TJ Watson in IBM. Oh. Super. What's your biggest deployment? Is it, is it From what perspective? Is it uh, size, petabyte size, or is it? So from a data perspective, um, Good question. I don't know which one it is, but we, I mean, we have large scale solutions that represent multi billions of nodes, but then that doesn't necessarily translate into a very large disk space. 
I think, I mean, the Panama Papers is not that big, but it's 10 terabytes of data, but all the data is not uploaded in Neo4j either. What we look at is mostly, I mean, when we get proud of performance is when you have a lot of connections. So you may deal with a much smaller subset of data, but the connections is the tricky piece where you cannot, you cannot uh, come up with a solution in a relational database. So we're, we're not normally not talking about disk space. All right, one more question. Perfect. All right. Actually, yeah, congratulations on the investment. What are you going to do with the money? Like, this is where are you moving to? Like, what's the future? Like, sure. What are you kind of terms? Are you on? What are we doing with the money? We are putting a big chunk of that money into product development. So we believe that. The product side has always suffered since we always had a very clear vision where we wanted to take the company, but we didn't have enough ammunition to motor very quickly. So we were always running the company from a resource constraint perspective to make sure that we, we have a day tomorrow. Now when we have more capital in the bank, we're, we're putting a lot of that in use with a, the with a product. So we may consider a couple of small acquisitions, we're doubling the engineering team in Malmö and London within the next nine months. So you will see a lot more on the product side within the next year. That's that's great. That was a great final question. Uh, if anyone comes up with more questions, Lars is here for one-on-one -on -one questions right now. And when you come up for questions, feel free to grab. <laughs> Swag. Um, there are actually a few of these USB plugs in the Neo4j shirts here, and I want to give a great big round of applause. Chief operating officer.